Hello and welcome back to the Open Hardware MiniConf. Now, according to the original schedule, Steph Piper was going to be doing a talk now, but the amazingly talented Steph is unwell at the moment, so I'm filling in. And what I'm going to be talking about is when things go wrong. So this whole presentation could fail terribly and I will still have succeeded. I hope. That's my theory. If I set out to do a talk about failure and it fails, then that's a win. So there were a few difficulties that we faced. Oh, and um, also just a reminder, if you have questions and things, I'm not necessarily going to see them live, but uh, drop them in the chat. And <laughs> Mark said, did I steal his slide of, if you didn't design a fuse in your circuit, the circuit will find one for you. <laughs> yes, that is actually failure number two. We're going to get to that, Mark. We have a good example of that. So uh, this project, this collection of projects, I should say, because there, for the hardware project this year, we really had three loosely associated boards. There is the swag badge, the rockling, which is the sayo that goes on top of it with the FPGA, and the party button, which Steph designed. And we've had issues with all of them. So I'm just going to talk about a couple of the things that we faced and ways we worked around those issues. So I'm going to try to show you some live stuff. I have zero slides. It's just going to be looking at hardware and messing around with it. And if we're really lucky, we'll let some smoke out. So uh, where to begin? Okay, so the, um, this is the Rockling, which is the little fish-shaped FPGA board with the, uh, the theremin front end on it which was the outline of this was designed by Andrew and the PCB layout was done by Bob, who you can see over my shoulder on this side. <laughs> and uh, so there are some very interesting aspects to the design here, which caught me out when it came to assembly. So the first thing is that because this is being designed primarily, well, not primarily, but one of the major aspects to it is the visual the way the board was designed, we wanted this to be the front that is presented to you when it's in use. Unlike most PCBs, we didn't want all of the parts to be on the visible side, we wanted them to be on the back. So Andrew designed the layout of the PCB and then Bob did the layout and putting all the parts on the back. And he's going to talk about that um, right at the end of the mini-conf. So that'll be really interesting to see as well. But one of the implications of that is that when the production files are generated out of KiCad, it has all of the parts on the back of the PCB and not on the front. Now that's not really a big deal as long as you are paying attention, which apparently I was not. <laughs> and it led to a bit of a problem. So what happened was that the production files were generated and I uploaded the Gerber's to JLC PCB, who did the fabrication of them. So it's a four layer PCB. And on the order form for the PCBs, there is a little tick box where you can select whether you want a stencil. So the solder paste stencil is used, to, um, used as a mask to control where solder paste is applied to the board. I ticked that box, didn't think any more of it, and selected the solder mask for the top of the PCB. And when it got back, when it arrived, I opened the box and this is the stencil they shipped me. <laughs> you may notice there's something missing, a little thing called apertures. Apart from a couple here, which are apertures that are on the bottom of the PCB, all of the important stuff, all of the apertures that we need for applying the solder paste were just not there. It is entirely my own fault oh, and We're back from that little video failure. It is entirely my own fault for not being aware when I was ordering it. Now, the thing is that these production boards, we were starting to run a little bit short on time. So there wasn't time to simply order a new stencil. Luckily, Bob remembered that we still had the stencil from the first round of prototypes. So right at the start of the process, we had ordered a small number of prototype PCBs. And on that order, the stencil was on the correct side of the board. 
And this is the stencil right here. So this is the stencil for the prototype. Now the difficulty is that the stencil for the prototype was not quite the same as the stencil that we needed. So it's not just a simple matter of putting it down, putting on the paste, because some of the parts had changed and a couple of the parts had moved. So we then had to try to figure out how to get the stencil, or how to get the solder paste onto all of the boards in an efficient way. And one thing I had heard of, a story I'd heard many years ago, was about people modifying solder stencils by uh, paste stencils by soldering closed apertures that they don't want. And so I thought, why not give it a try? However, I very quickly discovered that it is pretty much impossible to solder stainless steel. <laughs> and uh, when I tried, I tried different fluxes and things. I just couldn't make any solder stick. I tried abrading the surface. Probably with the right flux and the right solder, I could have made it work. And I could have soldered closed the apertures that I don't want anymore. But I failed. So there was then a suggestion of how about just covering up apertures with tape. And that's what I'm going to show you now. So you can see on the back of this stencil, there are some of the apertures closed up with Kapton tape, which is very, very thin. I was quite skeptical uh, when I first heard of the idea. And I thought, well, let's just give it a try. We'll see what happens. What I was worried about was the thickness of the tape, the tape holding the stencil off the PCB and allowing leakage underneath. So if I spin over here and go to the overhead camera, you can see here, oops, the, uh, the stencil. And on the back, you can see the capped on tape. So what I did was use a scalpel and some tweezers and cut off tiny little pieces of tape and then just covered up the holes that I did not want paste to come through. Yeah. So that way it, uh, it wasn't putting paste down on the board where I don't want it. And what you can see here is the, um, the vacuum bed. This system was designed by Sion, the unexpected maker. So it's a really cool system. The idea is that you connect a vacuum cleaner and this acts as a vacuum bed and sucks the stencil down onto the target board. So, and there is a cutout there. This particular cutout was done by exporting a DXF out of the original design that Andrew did and then bringing it into Fusion 360, applying the DXF as a shape onto this uh, and then recessing it enough for the PCB to fit in there. So what I was thinking of doing, if I get this in approximately the right place, now this is not at all how this would normally be used. This is just sitting on my bench because I happen to have an overhead camera here. And please excuse the back of my head. But uh, what I'm going to do is just put some solder paste on here and uh, show you the end result. So this is not actually going to be populated. So I'm not really all that concerned. This is just a test of the whole process of applying solder paste with some of the apertures masked out. So I grab my spatula, scrape it across the stencil. I'll just put that aside for now and try not to lose any of the expensive solder paste. <laughs> the PCB is stuck on the bottom. There we go, it's fallen off. So there we have the pasted PCB. And because I was just doing this without any proper alignment, I suspect that these apertures are going to be all over the place. But at least you can see there under the microscope, we'll get the focus correct, that there is paste on the PCB. And if I move over, where is an area? Well, you can see there are some examples. These particular pads just here don't have any solder paste on them because I masked that out on the stencil. And you can see the alignment there is quite bad. But also there are some parts down here that have no solder paste and down here. There were also some parts that were on the old design that are not on this new one. And what you can't tell is that they were also masked out mm -hmm. because on this current system, on this current version, there is no footprint there anyway. But if I had used that stencil without having that tape applied, there would be blobs of solder in different random places on here where the old parts were. So what this has left us with is a PCB 
that has solder paste on the vast majority of the pads, horribly misaligned as you can see in this, but at least it's on there and there are only a couple that are missing. So then what I did was use a syringe to apply solder paste just to the pads that had been added in the new version and were not existing in the old stencil. So that was a bit of a hacky way to do it, but it actually worked out surprisingly well. Now I'm being a really bad advertisement for the system here because I got the alignment so wrong, but at least you can see the general concept. So if you have a situation where you need to make some changes to a stencil that you've already produced, uh, then you can possibly do that by closing up apertures that you don't need anymore. So that was one of the issues we had to overcome. So one of the other problems, and this is coming back to Mark's comment earlier, which was if you do not design a fuse into your circuit, the circuit will choose a fuse for you. And uh, that also comes down to an issue with something that we've seen on these boards as we started testing them. So this particular board has failed initial testing. So I know that this one is not going to do good things. And if I turn on my handy multimeter here, so this on-screen display is the multimeter that is on my bench. And the power that is coming in here, this USB cable, is actually coming from my lab power supply and the multimeter is measuring the current that it's delivering. Now, when these boards power up, what they really should do is pull a tiny amount of power, maybe a few milliamps, because when they initially begin, the FPGA does not have anything loaded on it. There is nothing actually running. There's nothing executing. So it's a trivial amount of power draw. And this particular board, one of the things we discovered, in fact, the way we tracked this problem down is we had a couple of these boards that failed testing, but we didn't know why. And Andy took um, several of the boards home and put them in a, a bag and transported them home. And then when he got home, opened the bag and put the pieces out on the table and something small fell out and there's a little silver part. And I was wondering, where does that come from? And it turns out that it is the 48 megahertz um, crystal, which is, where is it? It's on the board yeah. right there. <laughs> it's over there. Um, yeah, so just here you can see that little silver part above my finger. That is the 48 megahertz uh, crystal, which is used by the FPGA, and it had fallen off. And our first thought was, well, there's been some terrible assembly error. Like I've simply failed to do the reflow properly and it's fallen off. And then we started testing some more boards and we discovered uh, to our surprise that they were pulling a large amount of current and getting very hot very quickly and uh, demonstrating that fuse principle. So with this particular one, what I'm going to do now is attempt a recovery. I don't know if this is going to work, but let's try it. So I'm going to turn on my lab supply just for a moment and there may actually be some smoke here. So let's just see what happens. <laughs> Watch the reading on the multimeter. All right, I've turned it on. Look, you can see it's hit an amp. And oh, I don't see any smoke. I want smoke. <laughs> let's see if we can arrange some smoke. One way to get smoke, now because I happen to know where this heat is coming from, is to put some flux on there. So if I now turn the power supply back on again, it hopefully will heat up the flux and we will get some smoke. Maybe I need to turn up the current limit. Yes, I think I need to turn up the current limit. Let's give it two amps and see what happens. No, nope, I think the current is being limited maybe in the cable, but I can feel that it's getting warm. So what was happening is that when we connected this to a laptop, uh, to Andy's laptop, it was supplying enough. Oh, there is a little bit of smoke coming off. Yeah, hey, hang on, I'll see if we can capture that. I'll stuck it, stick it under the microscope. You can no longer see the multimeter, but that doesn't matter. But Whoa. the, um, the for, the, yeah, you can just see a bit of smoke coming off there. So the 48 megahertz crystal is getting hot enough that it is heating up that flux that I put on it and there is a bit of smoke coming off. 
Yeah, so you can just see it drifting up there. Uh, I do, but I don't have an easy way of getting it onto the stream. <laughs> so it's still sitting there pulling an amp. So what I was thinking of doing was maybe getting the hot air running and just to demonstrate that this is where the power is going. So we saw that there was an amp of current being pulled then. I am going to put this under the microscope, run the hot air and remove that oscillator. Where is it? Right there. So there will be a little bit of noise when I'm running this hot air, unfortunately. So effectively what was happening was that these were self-disassembling circuit boards. They got hot enough that it melted the solder and that was what made the, um, the oscillator fall off. There's a, um, a very interesting project being done by, uh, that was worked on a little while ago by someone at the Hackspace to do self-assembling PCBs, which worked on a simple principle. You passed a lot of current through a layer of the PCB. There we go. So we removed the crystal. It passed a lot of current through the PCB and made it get hot so that you could have it self-assemble. And now if I move this back over under the overhead camera and we can see the current, the uh, lab supply is currently turned off. I'll plug this in, turn on the lab supply. And you can see there we are getting about 16 milliamps being pulled by the board. So the short is passing through the crystal, which is one of the last things that I would have expected to be happening. But there you go. Sometimes you just got to look at where things get hot, find that um, self-assigned uh, fuse, and then use that as a clue to guide you to where the problem is. So the board itself still feels quite hot to me, but that's just because I've been putting it under the, the hot air. But now if we put a new crystal onto here, this board may well be, uh, may well be functional. So how am I going for time? How long have I been talking so far? 17 minutes. I've got ages. Okay. So what we could try doing is put another crystal on this. I did not plan this far ahead, <laughs> so I don't have one handy. Um, they are in a box over in the corner, I believe. Just had to check that I wasn't going to rip the microphone off something when I walked away. So this is the box of parts that go into the Rockling. It's uh, many, many different parts. And this isn't all of them either. Many of the really common jelly bean parts like 10K resistors and 1K resistors and 4K7s and those sorts of things, those are all reels on my pick and place machine. So these are the, some of the unusual ones. So in here, we should have a crystal. It's a microphone, inverter, new regulator, power switch. Nope, surely there is a crystal somewhere. Not there, not there. No, perhaps I don't have it here. It might be somewhere else. So. We also have one question for you. Sure. So let's uh, let's put that aside for now. I won't proceed with adding that extra part onto there. Okay. So the third uh, little area of failure that I want to talk about and problems that we had to resolve is in relation to the party button. So this is the add-on uh, which. Steph Piper designed, uh, Steph from Elke Education. And uh, this is based on a project that she did, a, I think it was a couple of years ago, where she built a very large art installation, which was like a pedestrian crossing. And that's why it has this shape. And the pedestrian crossing had a, the button on it, the regular pedestrian crossing button. But the idea was that when you walked up to it, it was a party button and you would press it and lights would start flashing and things would happen on this big, pedestrian crossing installation. And so what we have here is a miniature version of her full size two plus meter high, I think it is, art installation. But it's in the form of a simple add-on that can go onto a conference badge. And there are a couple of interesting things about this design. 
One is that you can plug it into a badge and it will receive its power from the badge and be controlled by it. So there is a transistor here which turns on LEDs which will appear through the PCB. Uh, but you can also use this little add-on stand which provides power to the SAO connector. So if I plug that in, and also it is mechanical, so it allows it to stand up by itself. So you can put that on it, the bench and it becomes self-supporting. So if you press the pedestrian crossing button and hold it down, you'll see that there are LEDs on the back that shine through the PCB. So they are rear-mounted LEDs and they are changing color over time. These are LEDs that have built-in drivers that uh, just cycle through different colors. You don't need any logic or a control system to run them. So it's a pretty cool thing. And by taking that off and applying it to the badge, what you could do is have this turned on by logic within the badge because it can be controlled through these pins. Now, one of the difficulties that we had with this one is that there were a couple of iterations of the design and the layout of the PCB and the schematic at some point, I think, may have diverged. We're not quite sure yet what the, the sequence was, but it doesn't really matter at this point. So what ended up happening was that we had a design that we thought was final based on testing that had been done on prototypes. And then the PCBs were ordered. And when they arrived, they didn't work. And it turned out that there was a misconnection on the PCB. So going back across to the handy dandy microscope once again, What we can see here are the tracks on the PCB. You can see there are, there are some points here for an LED. There's a surface mount LED option as well. Two options for transistors, which is just connected in uh, direct parallel. So this is a dual footprint. You can either use a surface mount part or you can put a through hole part on there, whichever you're more comfortable with. And likewise, these footprints are dual footprints. It has holes in them here so that you can put a regular through hole resistor and it has pads so that you can put a surface mount resistor on it if you want to. Now the difficulty or the change that we eventually track down is this trace here which comes off this connector of that pin on the connector right there comes down this part of the board comes across and then it goes through a via or via. Someone needs to tell me the correct way to pronounce that because I still don't know after all these years. They go through that to the other side of the PCB. It wanders up here and it comes out and joins on the other side up here somewhere. Anyway, the issue is that the, this track goes to the wrong place. So in order to fix that, we need to do a couple of things. Now I have here my handy dandy little jeweler's grinder. So the way to apply this fix is that first we need to cut this track like that so that there is no longer a connection running up to the transistor. And then the next thing we want to do is redirect that because we still need that connection to go through. It's just that it was going to the source uh, pin and we want it to go to the gate instead. So what um, what I do to fix that, I just change the tips on my handy little grinder and just buzz off a little bit of the solder mask like that. And then we've got some exposed copper that can be soldered on too. So then a jumper can go from that point and it can come up and be soldered onto this pad here. Now, you might be wondering why I would bother scraping back the solder mask and putting a jumper on from this point, doing it right out here at the end of this track, instead of doing it from here where there is a nice big pad. And what I could do is run a jumper from that point up to here and not have to do that uh, fiddly work of attaching it just on here. Now, the reason for this is that we want to send these out as kits so that people can assemble them themselves. Now, if you look at one here, which has already been patched, 
This one has the little jumper that runs from this point on the PCB and it runs up to this pad. What we could do is solder from here, but when it comes time, there are two problems. Firstly, when it comes time for someone to put the header into this point and then to solder it on, the jumper would probably come off. And that is if we hadn't filled that hole anyway in putting the jumper in place. We would need to put the jumper in place in a way that doesn't fill the hole and allows the uh, pin header to be installed. So in planning this fix, my, one of my, objection, my objectives was to put the fix in place and not have it thermally impacted by other soldering that is going to be done on the board after the fix has been done. So what we're going to be doing over the next little while is applying this patch to all of the 50 or so of the party buttons that we have so that when they are shipped out to those who receive them, they will get them in the patched state and then you can just put on the extra parts and assemble it as you normally would. And when you put the parts on here and solder these connections, because this solder joint is at the end of this long thin track, the heat of doing this solder joint it will begin to flow down this track, but it's isolated enough that it should not melt this joint at the same time. So that jumper will stay in place even while you are soldering this header in. So that might be a bit of a strange design objective in terms of how that um, this patch was designed, but you just have to work with whatever the circumstances are. Um, so a couple of minutes, is it? All right. Okay. In that case, I think I had better jump to some questions. What questions do people have? We're talking about whether you could drill. Ah, yes. Okay. Yes. So this is referring to the solder stencil, I assume. Yes. So on this, yeah, on this PCB, which has some pads that need solder applied to them, one of the issues is then how do you put that solder on? The way I have been doing that is just with a syringe. So I use the stencil to apply the majority and then I syringe on for the extra parts. But one thing that I was considering was drilling extra apertures into this PCB, not into the PCB, into the stencil. I have not actually done that and um, part of that was a bit of a risk analysis thing because the benefit of doing it means that it saves me a little bit of time, a very small amount of time with the syringe but the downside to getting it wrong is ruining the stencil. And so I did not want to risk um, putting this under the drill press and drilling a couple of 0.8 millimeter holes or something in it and messing up the stencil. But modifying the stencil is something that I would like to try in future. So once we are beyond the, the mission critical aspect of this, I'm probably going to grab an old stencil. I've got a collection of stencils that are from obsolete designs and just try drilling and cutting different shapes into it and see if there is some way that I can modify the stencil to add apertures as well as to remove them. So are there any other questions? Martin was asking, could you not cut on the other side of the board nearer to the transistor to give you a short length? Uh, quite possibly. Let me have a look. Okay. So could I cut up closer to there on the other side of the PCB. Yes, I can't remember where that goes. Oh, it's to there. So I could cut from there. Yes, but I would still need somewhere to, well, actually, no, that would, that, sorry, just looking at this now. <laughs> if, uh, if we jump back to this view, and I'll try zooming the microscope out so that we can get a better overall view of what's going on and turn down the brightness. What's happening is that the, the cut from here goes through this wire, which comes through here and runs up this track to this pin on the transistor. So what we could do is cut the track on this side and further up, but the problem is that we still need somewhere to take a connection off this track and solder it 
onto either one of these surface mount pads or up here. So we need a destination for it as well as a source for the connection. And by changing the source to this side of the board, it would actually make it harder because we would not have easy access to the destination, which ideally is this existing surface mount pad right here. Last question was, people who only know Eagle Pad, do you think it's worth switching to KiCad? How do you find it? Uh, okay, so for the design on this, this was all done by Bob. And um, Bob is probably a good person to have an opinion on this because he uses, uh, he doesn't use KiCad as his main uh, software. He's used it for a few projects in the past, but for his regular day-to-day -day contracting, I think you use Altium, is that right, Bob? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so for me personally, I use Eagle for all of my day-to-day -day work. Bob uses Altium for his day-to-day -day work. So neither of us are native KiCad users. Uh, and I've used it a little, playing around with other people's designs. Um, I haven't made the jump into using it. Uh, I've found in, I know that there has just been a big new release that came out only you know, a week or two ago. So a lot of things like keyboard shortcuts and things have just changed in KiCad. So experiences that people have had with KiCad up until about a week ago may not be valid anymore. Apparently things have improved significantly with that change. And um, from my personal experience has been that I found the disjointed nature of the way the PCB and schematic tools work to be quite frustrating because I'm used to the highly integrated system that Eagle uses and the idea of separating out those two things and having them very loosely coupled, I've, I found quite frustrating when I've been using KiCad in the past, but it is certainly a very capable piece of software. And um, if anyone is wanting to get started with PCB design from a hobbyist perspective, that is the thing that I would recommend. Okay. So I, are we about out of time? I think we're out of time. So uh, I'm going to wrap myself up now. <laughs> there was a question about the crystals, John. Another question. Ten seconds. Ten, yes. Why were the crystals shorting? Ah, that is, that is a really good point. So I am not 100% sure yet, but... I think that the problem is that the pads under the crystals or the apertures for the crystal footprint is allowing a little bit too so much solder paste to go on and it is making contact with the body of the crystal. So there is a short circuit that is happening around the edge of the crystal body and um, that's where the, all that heat is coming from. So once the crystal is removed, there is no more short circuit. But why that would be a problem is also a little bit of an unexplained thing at the moment because the way they are connected to the FPGA, uh, typically with crystals, they, in this sort of format, they have four pins and two of them will be ground pins and two of them are the pins that go to the rest of the circuit. So those pins are normally very, very low power. They are just the um, a signal that comes from the FPGA, um, which excites the crystal and makes it oscillate. So we should be talking about nano amps or micro amps of power through those connections anyway. So why shorting those pins in particular causes a dead short and very high current drain? I don't yet have an explanation for that. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, we're gonna have a short break and then we're going to be back with the next presentation. So we'll see you all soon.